All right. Can you hear me now, Ariel? All right. So it's a few minutes past six o'clock our time, and uh, it's a few minutes past five o'clock some other folks' time. So uh, I do want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, the folks on Pal Talk. Uh, not sure who all's on there. Folks on Facebook, not sure who all's on there. There's got to be a way for me to be able to see exactly what it is. I, if we went to YouTube, uh, I could pull it up on my phone and see exactly who's on. But because that was that was very interesting this past weekend with the conference. Uh, <clears throat> so I do have uh, a couple things I'm going to send out. Uh, or at least one thing that I'm going to send out to see what everybody thought about uh, the conference, how everything went, and uh, you know, kind of see what what everybody's idea, uh, how they thought about it, or what they thought about it, and see where we go from there. But one thing that I do say is uh, we've got uh, quite a bit of feedback uh, from it, which was very interesting to to see. Uh, and it's all positive feedback too. Uh, a lot of folks enjoyed it. Uh, the different uh, styles, uh, the different presentations, how people did their own thing. It was really interesting. And uh, we've heard a lot of good stuff about that. So, um, <clears throat> so that's good. And uh, for those, those that are listening um, this evening, watching this evening, uh, I do want to mention real quick, the, uh, the UTB radio app, um, it was really interesting today. I was on the the main site where we can look at uh, statistics and things like that. And uh, there's not as many people this month so far as last month, but we're getting there. Uh, but the real interesting thing was is uh, it shows me real time where people are listening. And so there was actually somebody here in Frankfurt, uh, the northern part of of the county, listening. And uh, then somebody pops up from uh, South Africa and starts listening. So that was just, it was, <clears throat> it was really interesting to, uh, uh, to see that. So that was something that, that I found very interesting. Also, uh, one of the things that I do want to mention is last month, our website had two, over 2,000 visits. And that's the most visits that we've had in a month's time. And I think this time, uh, so far this month, we've had 1,300 hits on the website so that's quite a bit of traffic so people know or people are going to it and looking at it and seeing that we're here uh, it's just we need people to show up <laughs> once they do find out that we're here uh, <clears throat> but uh, all that aside it's just kind of interesting to to look at some of those things so I wanted to share that stuff with you all all right um, go to Matthew chapter 3 we're going to continue on Matthew chapter 3 we've started Matthew chapter 3, um, quite a few weeks ago, I'm thinking this is the seventh message on the book of Matthew chapter 3, and I think it's the 25th or 26th overall message for the book, so <clears throat> we're getting there slowly but surely. Um, but Matthew chapter 3, what I'm going to do, we're going to start reading in verse 5, we'll read down through verse 12. And uh, we'll see how far we can get uh, in this this evening. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 5. Then went out to, Jeru uh, out to him in Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. Uh, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not, uh, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. 
Uh, we're grateful that you've preserved it throughout the ages, that we can have it, that we can handle it, and we can study it. Uh, as we take a look at the book of Matthew, may we open our eyes and hearts and understanding uh, what's going on here. <clears throat> uh, we know and understand that this, this is not written specifically to us, but uh, we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, uh, we can study these things um, that we might have hope, uh, that we know that the things that you write here to the nation of Israel you will accomplish, and that, that allows us to know uh, that we can take a look at the things that you have written to us, and we know that you accomplish those as well. Uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So as we've gone down through here, one of the first things that we've already got and we've, you know, we've gone through and we've talked about uh, with, with chapter 3 here, John the Baptist shows up, right? And what happens is John the Baptist comes out. And he's in the wilderness. In fact, if you look up uh, in verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So he's out there in the wilderness of Judea preaching. Right? And what's he preaching? Repent, for, uh, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there's a couple of things that we've not really talked about yet. But notice where he says, repent ye. All right? So that ye there, anytime you see that word ye, it's the plural form of you. So one of the things that we've already talked about and established so far here is the fact that when you're talking about the nation of Israel, there is a national repentance. There is a national confession of sins. And there is a national baptism. And what, what we see here is, and we've, we've gone through, the, through the, all the verses and, and talked about um, the fact that there to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation and all those things. We've looked at those verses. So uh, just for time's sake, <clears throat> go back and check some of those those messages out and you can see that now as we continue on down through here he's saying repent ye all right <clears throat> so who would be the ye here well he's talking to the entire nation of Israel right more specifically that apostate group out there um, you've got folks here uh, in that apostate nation um, some are just not going to believe what's going on in fact you notice you drop down um, <clears throat> to verse 5 and it says then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and what they do what as we go down through verse 6 it says and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins so when we have somebody coming in to that little flock and we've gone through and talked about how that little flock is 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 started uh, right here with John and it's very it's very interesting um, you know, growing up Baptist, you always had the, uh, what was it, the trail of blood or something like that. Um, and what they would do is a lot of Baptist churches would trace their lineage all the way back to John. And they'll say, well, we're one of the original ones. We're, we're in the same line as John the Baptist. And yeah. And so then they say, well, we're real Baptists. We're not like the other Baptists that can't trace. And, you know, you get into all that stuff. And what does Paul say about endless genealogies? All right, we don't care about endless genealogies. You can talk about who you are and, and all that stuff, but that shouldn't matter. The only thing that should matter is what the book says. And it's really interesting as you come down through here. <clears throat> what happens is some of these people, what? They're believing the message, they're repenting, and they're going in. And how is it that they do this is they're partaking in John's baptism. And so then you've got some folks who are out here who do not partake in John's baptism. In fact, you see in verse 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? <clears throat> and so you've got these, these, uh, these Pharisees out here. You've got the Sadducees. Uh, we, we've, we've already looked at, uh, you've got scribes, right? You've got all these scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, all these religious people. And we looked at the last time uh, the fact that those guys were sitting in Moses' seat. Right? They are the spiritual leaders. They should have been the spiritual leaders. And that's where we kind of left off the last time. Um, 
But notice what he says to him. He says, bring forth uh, fruits, meat for repentance. So one of the things that we notice real quick, and we'll just we'll, we'll glance over this real quick. Go over to Matthew chapter 21. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here because we've already, we've already dealt with this. Um, Matthew chapter 21 he, Jesus Christ gives a, a parable. And at the end of this parable, if you notice in, in uh, Matthew chapter 21, uh, let's, let's take a look at verse 42. <clears throat> he, he's, he's given the, the parable of the vineyard and, and what's going on there. And every time that the, the, the householder uh, that, that planted the vineyard, uh, any time that he sent somebody there to check it out, uh, what happened is they killed them, they stoned them, they beat them. And then he says, well, I'm going to send my son. They'll reverence my son. What do they do? They say, here's the son. Let's kill the son and we'll take that inheritance. And at the end of that, we get down to verse 42. It says, Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? Now, I want you to think about this real quick. So he's talking to who? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and all these folks. And what is it that he says to them? Have you never read the scriptures? Well, I'll tell you what, if, if, <laughs> what's she not? Uh, if, you, if you think about that, how often could you go to right now today to the majority of, of churches and say, have you never read Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul lays out the mystery? Have you never read in Romans chapter 11 where we're told that Paul is our apostle? Have you never read that there is a difference between what has been kept secret and what has been spoken since the world began? Have you never read? And so that's exactly what Jesus Christ is doing back here with these religious leaders, by the way. The leaders in that religious system. He's saying, have you never read the book that you're supposed to put up? You know, one of the things we talk about is the local church is to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. Right? One of the things that the church is supposed to do is hold forth the word of life. And so what these guys should have been doing is doing exactly that, is they should have been teaching what God gave them. Well, the problem is, is they got into tradition and they started saying some certain things and trying to do certain things to make themselves look more, act more, and seem more holier than everybody else. You know, we, <clears throat> we could go over... And um, <clears throat> there's, there's di different parts we go to. And what, one of the places Jesus Christ tells the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees there, he says, um, you, make, you, make, you, you make the outside look good. You clean it up, make it look good. But the inside, you're just full of dead men's bones. And that's exactly what's going on here. <clears throat> the inside is the issue. And one one of the time, you know, one of the things that we, I'm always leery when I look out and I see a lot of people following a person or a ministry, and I kind of pay attention to those things and think they're probably not doing something right. If they've got a whole bunch of people, um, there's probably something wrong with that. <clears throat> now that doesn't discount the fact that there are good people out there that are teaching the right thing that have a bunch of people that follow them. But, um, you know, you look, that's a, that's a, that's an exception rather than a rule. But what happens is <clears throat> that's who you're dealing with here. And that's what, that's what Jesus Christ starts off with says, did you never read in the scriptures, the stone, which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, what's really interesting here is <clears throat> he's talking about himself, and they should have realized that. And, you know, you keep on going down through here in verse, four, verse 43. He says, therefore I say unto you. Well, who's the you there? Well, it's the Pharisees and the scribes and all that. And you'll see this a little bit later on. Uh, the chief priests and all those guys. You'll see that in a minute. But he says, I, uh, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So it's really interesting when John starts off, he says to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those that are showing up to his baptism that shouldn't have been there, he says, 
O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? And then he says, bring forth therefore what? Fruits meet for repentance. Bring forth fruits that are acceptable as the, uh, for, for repentance. And what is it that they're repenting of? Now, there's a whole bunch of, you know, we could get into an entire study about that and understand repenting doesn't have to do with uh, turning your back on sin. By the way, if you've never heard this before, I want you to think about this. You cannot ever in your physical body right now today turn your back on sin. It's impossible. So for somebody to say, well, repentance is turning your back on your sin, that's not possible. You can't do it. When, when, when you talk about repentance, repentance isn't changing um, or turning your back on sin, doing a 180 and going the other way. A lot of people say that. Well, <clears throat> repentance is changing your mind. Well, what is it that they needed to change their mind about? What were they doing in chapter 2 when the, when, the, when the wise men showed up and says, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Remember what that was our question is, where is the kingdom? You have the kingdom of heaven. That's what this book's about. That's what Matthew's about. And the question that we had there is, where is the kingdom? Well, if you're going to ask where the kingdom is, you've got to ask, where is the king? And that's what they started off with and says, where is the king? When is this going to take place? They were ready for it, but what did we find out in chapter 2 about Herod and the rest of Jerusalem? They weren't looking forward to it. <laughs> they, they, weren't, they were not ready for that. They didn't want it to happen. So when we get to chapter 3, John the Baptist says, Repent ye, ye, all of you, all the nation of Israel needed to repent. But what happens is there's some that do not, and that's why we see here in verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, notice he's not ye everybody, he's saying you, the religious leaders there, the kingdom of God should be taken from you and given to a nation. Well, who is that nation? Well, we've already talked about it. It's that uh, righteous nation of Isaiah chapter 26. It's that new nation of Matthew chapter 21. There's, there's something here that we've got going on that there's a new nation. Uh, Jesus Christ in uh, Luke chapter 12 verse 32 calls them the little flock, right? He says, fear not little flock for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So he takes it from the religious leaders who were supposed to be the ones who were sitting in, in Moses' seat as the leader of it all they were supposed to be the one getting them ready to go through that, and yet they didn't. So that's why John the Baptist says, why are you here? Yeah. <laughs> you got to think about that. <clears throat> How often do you ever go to a church and they're like, why are you here? You know, <laughs> Most churches are like, yeah, come on in, come on in. We want you to in. You know, we need our numbers up. We need to get more money in the trays and all that stuff. Come on in. John the Baptist is basically, it's like, why are you even here? Who's warned you about this out here? Because I know you didn't read about it. And you got to think about that real quick. Now, you know, most people has got this social idea of what uh, Jesus and his ministry was all about. Um, what I would say to those people is, have you never read in the scriptures? I mean, you look at how Jesus Christ responded to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the chief priests and all that. It wasn't a, well, I'm going to love you anyway. And here's the thing. How much did he love them? He went to the cross for them. But what did he do when he was there talking to them? He let them know, you're not right. You've got to get in that book. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And, and the, 
the judgment on them at that time is, I'm going to take that kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to this little nation, this little flock. Notice verse 44, And, what, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now that should remind you of Daniel. And of course, we've talked about Daniel and we've, we've gone back there before, so I'm not going to spend some time on that. Um, go back and read Daniel. And you'll find out in chapter 2, uh, specifically right around verses 44 and 45, what that stone does to those kingdoms. And by the way, we've not even gotten to chapter 4 yet, after the baptism of Jesus Christ, where Satan takes Christ up on a mountain and says, look at all this and I can give it to you. Look at all these kingdoms. Well, <clears throat> hold your place uh, in Matthew 21 real quick. <clears throat> go, over to, uh, go over to Revelation. over to Revelation chapter 10 real quick, or chapter 5. Um, Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> we'll get another passage in Revelation here in a second. But notice, Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Start off in verse 8. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. He says, When he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to, the, to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to, to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Notice verse 10, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests. All right, So that's that kingdom of priests and holy nation, all that that we know. God's going to make them kings and priests. But notice, where is it that they're going to reign? And we shall reign where? On earth. All right. So that should make you understand that there are some things going on. Go over to uh, Re uh, Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms here on this earth. All right? I want you to stop and think about this for a second. <clears throat> the kingdoms that are here on this earth. Everybody's fussing and fighting right now in this world to claim parts of the earth. And notice what's going to happen to all these kingdoms. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Do you know what? When you take a look at everything that's going on around in the world today, do you know what we can know? We can know that this verse right here is going to come, come to pass, and it's going to take place. Every kingdom that you have here on the earth one day will be the kingdom or... Um, as he says there, <clears throat> the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Who's going to run this one day? You know, one of the things you take a look at uh, most gang activity in every, every city, uh, wherever there's gang activity, their whole thing is, well, we run this territory. This is our block. You're, you're renting it. <laughs> Honestly, you're renting it. The place, I mean, our house right here where we're doing this from, we're basically renting this place. We, we, don't, we can't own it. It's not something that we're going to be able to own. What's going to happen is one day that everything that we see on this earth is going to be replaced by, and this is the best part, every, every mayor, every senator, every governor, every house uh, representative, every president, everybody that runs anything, is going to be a saint of the Most High God. That's going to happen one day. The best part is, is it's not just here on earth, but that's going to take place in the heavens as well. And we get to be a part of the ones in the heavens. So we take solace in the fact that we look at this stuff and we say, okay, we look at the world out here and we're thinking, okay, that's going to be a mess, but here's the thing. 
One day, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. That's going to be a great, glorious day. But the issue that I want us to see here is these kingdoms are going to be the are going to be gods one day. Back over to Matthew chapter 21. So there's no small thing that we should take into consideration as we look here in uh, Matthew chapter 22. I think I said 21, right? Matthew chapter 22. When he says to the religious leaders, I'm going to take the kingdom of God from you and I'm going to give it to a nation. Notice that's nation singular, not plural. Nations in Scripture is talking about the, the Gentile folks. All right. So as we take a look at this, we continue on down. Uh, verse, verse 45. And have you, ever, <laughs> have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and you're just like, man, I know they're talking about me. They're doing it in a way to kind of minimize the impact and, and try to be um, passive aggressive about it. But you're just like, man, I know they're talking about me. Notice here in verse 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. You know, so who's he talking to here? The Pharisees and the, and the chief priests. <clears throat> and they, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Now, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that we could get into as well. But what I, what I want us to notice and understand is what is it that John the Baptist is doing back here is he is starting something. You've got to understand, prior to John the Baptist showing up, you had 434, approximately 430 some odd years where God was silent after after talking and, and having the Old Testament scripture written down there was a 430 some odd year time period where God was silent and then John the Baptist shows up and what John the Baptist does is he starts doing something and that's one of those things that we want to make sure that we see go over to Luke chapter 1 <clears throat> Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> um, we'll, start off, we'll just start off in the, in the middle here. Uh, verse 13. Uh, Luke chapter 1 verse 13. In the context here what we've got is uh, Zacharias <clears throat> um, who ends up being John the Baptist's father. Uh, it, it's going through talking about his course and where, where he is and you know we can talk about how the fact that you can actually uh, figure out when Jesus Christ was born based upon when John the Baptist was born. And uh, we can figure out when he was conceived based upon the course that Zacharias had. So that's what you've got there. And it's really fascinating. If you've never done it before, go through Luke and figure that stuff out. Uh, it's really fascinating. But uh, notice verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So who is this? It's John the Baptist. Verse 14. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. So... You know, that's one of those things you think about, you know, everybody, a lot of folks today, they talk about, well, you got that second blessing, right? So they talk about, well, you know, you get saved, that's wonderful, but there's, there's a second blessing where you've got to get the Holy Ghost to indwell you and all that stuff. Um, but I want you to think about this. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. That's amazing when you think about it. Uh, and there's probably an entire study you could do on that. And that, to me, that's just to, to think about that statement that this angel tells Zacharias. Um, I'm going to tell you exactly who your son's going to be. He's, he's not going to be, he's not going to drink wine or strong drink, which that tells me wine and strong drink are two different things. But anyway, I digress. But you notice, <clears throat> he's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost 
even from his mother's womb. Verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias. So he's going to go before him. Who? The Lord, their God. Um, go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, when you think about that, what does it mean to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children? When you think about what's going on, what is, what is repentance, right? When you repent, you're changing your mind, right? So there's, there's something that, that we can get into and talk about uh, spirit, soul, body. And your mind is in the spirit and the soul. And so then what you're doing is you're changing your mind when you believe something, all right? So what is it that he's going to do? He's going to go and tell them something, and it's going to make them to turn the hearts of the fathers, and your heart is right there in your soul. Your heart and your mind go together. And so then, you know, you've got a whole bunch of stuff there. Again, for time's sake, we can't get into that. But he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So that's the idea of getting them to change their mind. That's what he's talking about there. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. What he's, getting, what he's going to do is he's going to get them to change their mind. How does he do that? Because he's such a great guy? No, it's because he's filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. It's the Holy Ghost is going to work in and through John the Baptist to get to be able to teach enough to be able to get people to change their mind. <clears throat> Hold your place there real quick. Go over to go over to Titus. Now you're probably thinking, this isn't Sunday. What are you doing in Titus? Well, there's something in Titus that I think that's that's really interesting because, uh, especially especially in this context here. Notice in Titus chapter 1, um, what Paul's doing with Titus is he's giving him some, some recommendations. Here's, here's what, if you want somebody to be a bishop, here's, here's some of the qualifications that they need to uh, meet. Notice verse 7, Titus chapter 1 verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but of a but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught as he hath been taught, why? That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, when you take a look at that, the way that a, the way that he's supposed to be able to do that is to what? Take the things that he's taught. Well, what is it that he's going to be taught? The scripture. What he should be able to do is take the information and do what with it? To exhort and convince the gainsayers. Now, the whole issue there is God's word working in and through that bishop to be able to do that. And that's exactly what John the Baptist is doing here. The Holy Spirit, the word of God is going to work through John the Baptist to be able to convince those gainsayers. And you get back over to Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> And we see that's exactly what he's going to do. The angel of the Lord tells Zacharias, this is going to happen. By the way, we talk about uh, prophecies in Scripture, right? And how, how there's, I was looking the other day, there was a little over 300 some odd prophecies that uh, Jesus Christ fulfilled uh, from the Old Testament and New Testament and all that stuff. And it you know, you, you stop and take a look at some of those things, and I forget how many it was. You know, the, the probability that he fulfills eight of those 300 is astronomical. Uh, but then you start looking at the more, the more that you have on there, uh, it gets to the point where it's absolutely absurd that one person could fulfill every one of them. And so it's, it's a way to prove Scripture scientifically uh, specifically mathematically based upon statistics. But then you start thinking about these things. There, here, is, here is something that the holy or that the, the angel here says to Zacharias 
that John the Baptist actually fulfills. So this is a prophecy that John the Baptist fulfills. Would you, you notice there he says he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the, and the disobedient to, uh, to the wisdom of the just. Well, when does that take place? Well, he shows up and what happens? These people in Jerusalem and all Judea and the region round about, what do they do? They go to the wilderness. It's always fascinated me. He doesn't go to them. They come to him. He's out in the wilderness and they go to him. And what he does is he turns their hearts. And what do they do? They repent. How did they do that? By following in line with the baptism. So when you start talking about that bringing forth fruits, meat, meat for repentance, we'll look at this a little bit more uh, as we get to it. But what's, what's, the, what's the fruits? Well, the very first one that they have to do is what? Get baptized. So when you start talking about what's the fruit that is, that is meat for repentance, how is it that you show that you've changed your mind? Well, by faith, what does faith do? Faith says, well, let's, let me get in this water and you sprinkle me with water. And that's that baptism. That was the very first step. And what those Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes and the rest of the apostate Israel, what they should have done is they should have heard that and they were going to say, okay, first step, we need to come in and join together with the rest of that, that group that's now the believing remnant, that little flock. The way we're going to get into it is by that water baptism. All right, so notice, <clears throat> here, here's what it all comes down to. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Notice, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know what he's doing? He's getting these people. He's getting them ready. That's what it says, to make ready a people. Notice, notice it says, to make ready a people people prepared for the Lord. What happens is, is he's going to prepare a people, which happens to be that nation, that, that, that silly nation. All right, we, we've looked at that already. That righteous nation, that, that small, insignificant nation that the, that the rest of the apostate Israel is like, you're going to be doing something with those guys? Look at us. <clears throat> and you're going to take those guys? You know, when you look at, at uh, how they prayed, they were like, well, thank God we're not one of these publicans. You know, we're, we're better than them. We're, we're, you know, we've got it all figured out. And what John the Baptist, what Jesus Christ, what God the Father is doing is saying, I'm going to take this, I'm going to give it to a foolish nation. A people that you don't think much of and what is he doing? He's making ready a people prepared for the Lord. He's going to prepare some people to go into that kingdom to serve God. That's what John the Baptist is doing. He's preparing a people. Now, one of the things that we've talked about before, we've looked at it before. You've got the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, right? Um, after that, you've got the descending of the Holy Spirit. Of course, we've got the ascension of Christ before that, but Acts chapter 2, you've got the descending of the Holy Spirit, which is uh, just a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, right? I mean, Peter even says that. So you've got the Holy Spirit coming down. And the Holy Spirit's going to make it possible for those 12... Judas's replacement was Matthias. He's going to make it possible for those 12 to go and preach. Where? Jerusalem? In fact, let's go look at it. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. You know, I'm <clears throat> the longer the longer you get in, the longer you you get in and stay in this book and listen to stuff outside the more you start finding more and more little pet peeves that, that you have. This is one of them for me. One of them is second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, where everybody quotes, I have not seen or ear heard, and, and then they don't read verse 12 or 10. Uh, it's the very next verse, and it tells us that God has revealed it to us. But anyway, 
Here's another one. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. <clears throat> but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. When Jesus Christ, before he ascends, all right? So, what I want you to think about is, he ascends before the Holy Spirit comes down. So, you're probably right there on the chart, all right? Now, the folks on Pal Talk, I know you can't see this, but um, in your mind, visualize this the best you possibly can. So you've got the ascension of Jesus Christ. Then you've got, it's right before the ascension, he's, he's talking to him um, before the Holy Spirit comes down and all that. So you've got right before the ascension, you've got Jesus Christ talking to him. He says, but ye shall receive power. That's Acts chapter 2, right? The, the day of Pentecost. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and in Samaria, into the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, hold your place there. Go with me real quick. And this is one that everybody that's watching and listening should have memorized because we've gone through this multiple, multiple times. We should have this memorized. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Do what? <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. So I want you to think about this real quick. I'll have my eraser, so we'll mark that out. So what I want you to think about is, you've got, in, in Acts chapter 1, he says, I want you to go to Jerusalem and Judea. Right? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at something here in a minute on that. Jerusalem and Judea and then Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, all right? And what's really interesting is you notice here when he first pulls out the 12, what's he say? Go not into the way of the Gentiles or any, to any city of Samaria, Samaria, enter you not. So he tells them right here, don't go to the Gentiles, the uttermost part of the earth, or the or any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. So he says, don't go here. He says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, what we've got to know and understand is there's actually, at this time, man, I, don't, I wasn't really thinking about going through this, but we will. <clears throat> at this time, you had the 12 tribes of Israel were split as 10 and 2. All right? The, the capital city of the top ten, which would be really the real apostate Israel, would be Samaria. So you got to think, down here you've got Jerusalem and Judea. All right? Now, when you think about this, where is it that God set up his name was in that city, Jerusalem? All right? We don't have time to run those verses. Um, go search and see. So he set up his name in Jerusalem. And they're gonna, they were to go there every year with um, their sacrifices, right? They had to tithe. They had to go there and do all that stuff. And so what happened is the ten, the, the ten northern tribes said, you know what, that's just too far for us to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to make Samaria our capital and we're, gonna, we're going to do our own little chaz and we're going to separate ourselves from the rest of of the nation of Israel, we're going to make this and, and everybody come to Samaria because it's just too far for us to go to Jerusalem, even though God made provisions for that. So you've got that separation there. <clears throat> well, you got Jerusalem and Judea here, and then the uttermost part, that's Samaria, that's, a, that's up there. And so that's one of those things that you've got to think about as we're going through here. So you notice where Jesus Christ first tells them to go is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right? Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to Samaria. Well, that changes once we get to Acts chapter 1 because what we need to know and understand is when before that ascension of Christ where Jesus Christ is talking to them right here in Acts chapter 1, they're looking forward to the very next thing that they're expecting is the... the 
the coming of the Holy Spirit, then they're going to be looking for what? That tribulation period, that 70th week of Daniel. Based on that timeline, they knew that's the exact next thing that's supposed to take place. They're looking for that right there to take place. All right? And so what, what Jesus Christ tells them and says, I want you to go to, and it's really fascinating if you look at Acts chapter 1. Uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both. And then he lists four places. I find that very interesting. He says, now does that mean that the Holy Spirit has no idea what he's talking about and he just used the wrong word both? And it should have been unto me in four places? No. Notice how he does this. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. That's one. And in Samaria and, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So what he's doing is he's now adding back in those people. Now, one of the things Jesus Christ says, you're not going to go through all the cities of Jerusalem before I come back. So what does that mean? When Jesus Christ comes back at his second coming, what he's going to do is at that time, that's when they're going to be able to go and get to the uttermost parts of the earth. By the way, they couldn't fulfill the commission that people are trying to fulfill today until Christ came back. So if they couldn't fulfill the, the commission that God, that Jesus Christ gave them until he comes back, how are people right now thinking they are? Well, the problem is, is they think that they, that he's already come back and that's why he's got the, the kingdom in your heart. Well, that's not true. There is a spiritual aspect, but the kingdom is a literal, visible, physical, earthly, David kingdom vested in the nation of Israel where Christ is going to sit on a literal, visible, physical, earthly throne. And he's going to rule and reign, as the verse told us earlier, forever. So when we see this, <clears throat> that's what we've got going on. But the issue there is there's a tribulation period between when they're going to Jerusalem and Judea, and then they're not even going to be able to get out of that until Christ comes back. He says, you're not even going to go over all the cities of Jerusalem before I, before I come back. They can't even get that first part done until he comes back. So then that should make us understand some things. The, the, the interesting part for us is <clears throat> right in here, God's cut that prophetic program and pushed this, all this out. And that's what the world's missing right now today. That's what the church at large is missing. They, what, and the problem is, is they're still thinking that they're part of the little flock. You know what? <clears throat> when, when I was watching a, a local pastor here in Frankfurt... <clears throat> Uh, at the uh, the big Baptist church here in town. What he was saying was, Buck Run, you are the little flock. Buck Run, you are a kingdom of priests. Buck Run, you are a holy nation. Now there's a problem with that. One, what he's doing is setting his church up as the place to go, the place to be, and it's the only place you can go and be. And if you don't go there, then you're on the outs. You know, there's a difference between... <clears throat> go with me real quick to um, Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> How about now, RL? He said I lost sound. All right. Somebody, somebody called from Winchester. I get phone calls all the time, yeah. and uh, it's always about. 
Yeah, the United States of America calls us, California calls us, Louisville, and it's always um, your extended warranty on you. Anyway, <clears throat> you all get them too. But notice Galatians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 10. Is, you know, and we've talked about this, and I was talking to somebody about this the other day. There, and I'll just do a little plug real quick for uh, Grace School of the Bible. If you actually want to know how to study your Bible, get enrolled in Grace School of the Bible. Don't worry about all these other people trying to start institutes and trying to start Bible schools and all this other stuff. Go to one that we know for a fact gets you straight from the very beginning. Because your, your authority and your basis is not on the person, it's the book. And what happens is, is you get to find out what God's Word says and you get to learn how to study God's Word the correct way from the very beginning. And it's not some Johnny-come-lately trying to create something. Just get in there and find out what God's Word is saying. Now, do you have to have that? Absolutely not. But there is something that comes from that. And it's not, it's not an arrogance. Everybody thinks it's arrogance. It's a confidence. When I read this, here's the difference. When I read this book, I actually believe the words on the page. And you can understand it because you believe the words on the page. Now, to most people, it comes off as arrogant. I can't, I can't change that. It's, it's not confidence in myself. It's confidence in this book because I actually have a final authority. And it's not me. And it's not Brother Jordan. It's the King James Bible. And if I come off as the fact that I actually believe this, I'm just dumb enough to believe the words on the page. It's that simple. And so what, what comes about is, notice in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. There is a difference between confidence and arrogance. And here's the difference. Chapter 1, verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I'm not here to serve I'm not here to please people. You know, one of the things that we've we've talked about in our group before, and 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 Mike's Mike said this before, we're not a church that tries to please people. We're a church that's here to please God, so that we would be servants of Christ. We do things differently. I mean. You know, we've talked about should we switch it up and do two 45-minute parts on Sunday, which we could. But the problem is, once you get going, it's hard to stop. And so what happens is there's a confidence that comes from the actual word working in and through you, and that's what John the Baptist had. It wasn't the men-pleasing that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had. It was John the Baptist shows up full of the Holy Ghost from the time of his mother's womb and he's preaching something to be able to turn people's hearts, to change their mind about some things, and that's what we're here to do. And so when we look at these things, that's, that's the issue that we've got going on back here is John the Baptist just believed the words that God gave him. And he was able to go and preach and do what he needed to do. To do what? <clears throat> to prepare a people for the Lord. And that's exactly what we've got going on. Now, we go back to Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 8, <clears throat> John the Baptist is telling the Pharisees and Sadducees, he says, Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. What is it that's going to be a fruit of them changing their mind is step one, get baptized with his baptism. And you notice he says, And think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. You know that there is a difference between the real Israel 
and these guys. Just because you're just because you're in that lineage doesn't mean that you're in the right spot. In fact, that's what John the Baptist is doing. He's saying you're not in the right spot. Who's warned you about this to flee the wrath to come? And what what God's doing here? <clears throat> and and I think we'll do this next time. There's there's a tabernacle and. Um, You go back to Joel, and you go back to 2 Samuel, you go to Acts 15, and you find out that there's a tabernacle. Well, what was the purpose of the tabernacle? It was a place for God to dwell here on the earth. And we're going to look at that the next time, <clears throat> but I want you to think of it as we go, go with this. There's a tabernacle that Daniel built. The ark was there. The glory of God was there. And what John the Baptist is doing right here at the very beginning with this baptism is he's building a nation beginning here and that nation is to do what? Be the dwelling place for God here on this earth. And, you know, you think about that, that's the purpose of that Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And then we can get into, you know, the real purpose behind Second Chronicles 7. And we can get into we can get in all those things and understand a little bit more about all that stuff. And so we'll take a look at the tabernacle that David built uh, next time, and uh, we'll see how far we get through there. But notice, just because you can say that you're a descendant of Abraham is not enough. You're not the real Israel, and that's what John the Baptist is trying to say. What you need to do, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, chief priests. Anybody out there in the apostate nation, what you need to do is come forth with fruits, meat for repentance, and that first one is that baptism. So if we know and understand why that baptism had to be part of the nation of Israel's um, dealings, then we know that we're not to be water baptized in this way because God's not doing that today. God's not nation building. God is not building. He's, he's got something completely and totally different that he's doing. And uh, that's why it's important for us to come back and study Matthew chapter 3 and all this stuff to get a better idea of why, you know, ha having, your, having your mind and having your heart a reason why you believe the things you do. Don't just go around saying you believe stuff. Be able to defend what you believe. And by the way, it's not always, well, I won't say that. <clears throat> Uh, but the issue is always going to be understanding God's word right the divided. So I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We'll pick back up with the tabernacle next week and understand what's going on there, hopefully. And uh, we'll see what's going on with that. So uh, continue reading the book of Matthew. Hopefully you've been doing that as we've gone through, uh, specifically the book of Matthew chapter 3 as we go through this. Um, you know, we've only got eight verses in and we're on the seventh message so that's pretty good <laughs> uh, but i do want to thank you all for joining us on pal talk folks on facebook we greatly appreciate you all for joining us and uh we'll see you all sunday morning and uh until then grace and peace father we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word uh, that you've preserved it throughout the years that we can come to a greater knowledge and understanding and appreciation for what your book says what the bible says that we can by faith take what you give us and just by simple faith believe the words on the page and allow that to be the final authority in all of our thoughts and all of our, our actions that we should be to the praise and honor and glory of your grace. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace.